Hi, I'm Pastor Jim Spawn with the Point Church in Greenwood, Indiana. And you're joining us for the final week of our Isolated Beatitudes series. I hope you've got your Bible and notepad ready and you're uh, willing and ready to dig in now with separated time from all the other distractions. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the opportunity as always to meet with my friend across the screen here for us to open up your word. Your word says where two or more gathered, there you are in their midst. And we depend on that um, presence of your very spirit to teach and instruct us. Lord, we pray that you would move powerfully in this time, that you'd also meet the needs of uh, that one or those groups of people who are watching this right now. Um, Lord, I pray that you would also protect the time and the distractions. It's so easy for us to be distracted, Lord God, by other things. So let us focus right now upon your word and what you would have to say to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, we're getting into this final, um, final lesson here on the isolated Beatitudes. These are the blessings, the Beatitudes, that Jesus offers to individuals that are in different parts of the, the gospel story that aren't necessarily right there in the typical Beatitudes that we find in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this one isn't the last of all of them, but it is the last one we're going to be looking at in this series. As uh, this week of February 14th, on this coming Wednesday, we begin the season of Lent. And as we begin the season of Lent, we'll be going into this uh, new series focused upon prayer as one of the spiritual disciplines of prayer, fasting, and giving to those in need. And so we're going to be moving into this next week, a series on prayer. And I hope you'll join us because it'll go from uh, this next week all the way through Easter or Resurrection Sunday. Well, we're going to be looking today at John chapter 20 verses 24 through 31. And this is actually kind of a resurrection story, but it's a good one, I think, for us to finish things off on. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 24 through verse 31 in the New Living Translation reads as follows. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not, the other, not with the others when Jesus came. This was on the day of Jesus' resurrection. They, the disciples, told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound on, in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Here's the blessing. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Believing. Now, I, I've wished for years, ever since I was a kid, that I could have seen Jesus feed the 5,000. I've wished that I could have seen him walk on the water. I've wished that I could have seen him touch a leper and heal him, spit in the mud and heal the blind man. I wish I could have seen him, yes, even hang upon the cross. I've wished that I could have been there uh, when he appeared to Mary at the resurrection and, and watch her response as well as hear his gentle words. I, I wish that I could have been outside the tomb as the disciples came running in. I wish I could have seen what even Thomas saw in this story. But I never have. I don't have a time machine to go back and to do those things. And yet, I believe. I believe in a Savior named Jesus Christ 
who I've never seen in person. But I walk in a world where that would be called foolish. I walk in a world where seeing is believing. And we see on videos plastered across the internet, social media, the news, that this is the truth because this is what we're showing you. This is what is real because this is what you can see. Even though many times it might be edited or cropped or not displaying the entirety of the truth. See, I believe that there are three sides to every story. There's your side, there's my side, and then there's the truth. Because I believe that each of us have a certain perspective upon whatever situation, whatever story that we have experienced. And so we live in a world where seeing is believing. And where truth isn't understood unless we've seen it, unless we've read it, unless we've touched it or tasted it, unless we've heard it with our own ears, seen it with our own eyes, touched it with our own hands, experienced it for ourselves. But I believe in our day more than any other in generations past, to believe in Jesus Christ without seeing him is the most powerful thing that we could do because it breaks the chains of oppression and of bondage that our physical senses keep us in bondage to. I sometimes wonder if our eyes and our ears and our touch even our taste and our experiences have a greater power over our lives than we even let God to have a power over our lives. I'm speaking here to the church, to the believer. I want to encourage you in your belief today. Thomas was a believer in who Jesus was as rabbi, as teacher, as Lord. Yet there was a lack of belief that he had experienced. And that lack of belief was holding him back. And in our world today, I tend to think that we as believers need a reinforcement. A strengthening of our belief to understand what it means to live in the blessing of believing in a Savior yet without seeing him. P.F. Brzee once said, we must be rid of carnality or it will trip us up in some unforeseen emergency. Now, the word carnality, by definition, is relating to the body. It's relating to the flesh. Who we are in our physical form. But not only who we are in our physical form, but the satisfaction of what the physical form needs. It is our carnal nature, our need to satisfy, satisfy our inner desires, the physical being, satisfy our eyes in, in extravagant beauty, satisfy our taste buds in sweets and, and exotic flavors, satisfy our touch with high, sensitive, beautiful, wonderful things. To satisfy our ears with beauty and to satisfy our eyes with what we want to see. And some of that can be okay. To look upon a waterfall, a rainbow, a mother holding her newborn child, little puppies playing with each other, or cats playing and frolicking. Animals doing silly things. Yes, there can be a satisfaction to our, to our physical being that is not sinful. It's not something that's going to destroy us. 
But if we put too much effort into trying to satisfy even the silliest or most beautiful things in our senses, we can sometimes push God and our belief in him and the power he can have in our life to make us whole to the back burner. So again, P.F. Brzee says, we must rid ourselves of carnality. Or it'll trip us up in some unforeseen emergency because at some point, something tragic is going to happen in our lives. Church, something tragic is going to happen. That's the way of our world and that's the world we live in. Trage tragedy is around the corner at some unforeseen time and in un some unforeseen way. It may not be as extravagant or as extreme as some, but for us it could seem just as tragic. Losing of a job can be just as tragic as losing of a loved one. And if our beliefs aren't established in God, in the unforeseen, in his character, in his personality, in his care for us. And we have gotten too embedded in caring for our physical senses and who we are in our physical form and satisfying what we see and what we touch and what we taste and all these things, then we could be tripped up when those emergencies happen because we'll have forgotten to reinforce that foundation of belief. We've created for ourselves a, a sinking sand foundation, as the scripture might say. A house built on something that a wave could block, rock over. Galatians 5, uh, verses 7 through 8. Paul's writing to the church, and he says, You are running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God. For he is the one who called you to freedom. What causes you to stumble? What causes you to lose faith and lose belief? Is it what you see or is it what you don't see? Is it what you hear or maybe what you don't hear? When you feed and give in to fear or doubts that are caused by what you see or don't see or hear or don't hear, when you give in to the pleasures and allow it to be what controls your actions and where you're going to put your next five minutes, ten minutes, two hours. What is it that trips you up? See, feeding our carnal nature means that we're feeding even those things that could be defined as sin. Sinful cravings. Yeah, I'm talking very clearly. It could be uh, too much food. It could be what you put in your mouth as too much food, too much richness, not taking care of the temple that God has given you. It, it could be what you put in your eyes and what you look for. Yes, that could be pornography and how it destroys your mind and your perspective on the sexual relations between man and woman husband and wife. It, it, it could be in hungering after something that helps define you as a person here that is so different than this person, as in what we see in our political world. Having to put this into our eyes and into our mind so much to help reinforce our strong belief. we listen to there's so many things that could cause us to stumble because we're hungering after it way too much and putting God on the back burner Paul says a lot I believe in Romans chapter 4 through 8 in dealing with the idea that when we put our faith our belief in what is unseen Jesus Christ that he leads us into freedom you know, at the beginning of this, I said that I believe uh, that us believing in something that we haven't seen 
can help break the chains of bondage to our carnal nature. Throughout history, we have known scientists and explorers, great thinkers throughout the generations who placed their mind and their belief in something that was yet unseen and that belief and act followed then by action in what they didn't yet see and it caused them to pursue that path with passion that which they hadn't seen whether it be traveling around the world and discovering new countries finding an animal finding fossils the things that they did not understand and didn't believe didn't think were there but they believed that there was something there maybe it was space travel that there's possibilities that there's something more out there gravity science all these things that people can't see but yet they the idea of it drives them to understand it more i truly think that when we put our passions into what we have not yet seen it drives us to discover the reality of it yes almost the very physical being of it and it sets us free then because we're not in chains of saying well it's not there so I can't believe it so I'm not even gonna bother but when I believe my passions drive me to understand Romans chapter 4 verses 18 through 20 help us understand that uh, part of the blessing of belief without sight is righteousness Scripture says, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger and in stronger and in this he brought glory to God. His faith was attributed to him as righteousness. Belief even though he hadn't seen it come about, even though he hadn't seen it come about in himself or in his wife, he was old Things weren't happening. The experience in his carnal man, in his physical man, and in his wife's hadn't been known, and yet he believed. You see, holding true to what we believe builds in us righteousness. Romans 5, verses 2 through 5, I believe, talks about the blessing of belief without sight as it offers to us confidence and joy. Paul again writes, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Do you hear that? We confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. And we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Part of the blessing of believing without seeing is this confident joy as we look forward to what God's doing, the confident joy that that holds true even when hardships come because we need to stop looking at the physical and we start looking beyond into the spiritual realm of what God is doing. How he's trying to develop in us strength of character and the confidence of salvation. Taking away my desire to meet my physical needs in order to help me perceive the long-term impact of a belief even without sight. Paul continues in, in chapter 6, verses 16 through 23, I believe. He talks about the blessing of belief without sight. 
is a desire to live righteously and thus become holy by the gift of God. The part of the blessing of a gift without sight is that our desire now to live righteously that because he has attributed to it to us as righteousness, but also to live that way is, a, is this gift of God which is his holiness. Romans 6, 16 through 23. Don't you realize that you became, that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? I'm going to stop there. You become a slave to whatever you choose to obey. If you choose to obey the desires of your eyes to put pornography into your mind, you will be tainted and twisted and a slave to that. If you choose to obey and become a slave to alcohol, to drugs, to sexual promiscuity, to adultery, to slander, to whatever it is that is in your physical nature that you are prone to, you will become a slave to it. Paul goes on. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Talking about that again. Thank God. God, verse 17, once you were slaves to sin, but now you are wholehearted, you wholeheartedly obey this teaching that we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of our human nature, I'm using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all of this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led to ever deeper into sin. Paul continues, now you must live, give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligations to do right. And what was the result? You're now ashamed of the things that you used to do. Things that end in eternal doom. But now you're free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do these things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God is Jesus Christ. And our steadfast belief in him leads us in passion to follow after what he would teach us, leads us in passion to understand him more, to allow his teachings to be our understanding, to allow his mind to become our mind, his thoughts to become our thoughts, his actions to become our actions. As we discover, much like a scientist or an explorer, the vast character of God through Jesus Christ, and as we allow him to lead us and to teach us, along this journey that we travel. He leads us into actions of righteousness. He leads us into his holiness. And we no longer become a slave to the world and to our carnal nature. It moves us, as Paul says later on in his writings, from a natural bent towards sin, instead to a natural bent towards God. And as that bent changes, as God stamps his seal upon you and overwhelms you with his love that warms the innermost part of your being and helps you to realize his holiness and his desires for your life, you become free. Romans 8, 6 says, so letting your sinful nature control you Control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. I'd leave that with you as your final blessing of believing without sight. In the day and age that we're in right now, I believe life and peace, especially peace, are so needed. So seek him with your eyes. Know him with your mind. 
be led by him. Let your spirit be freed from the desires to fulfill the physical things within you and be filled then instead with the spirit of God to know confidence and joy, to know righteousness, holiness, life, and peace. Lord God, I pray right now for my friend on this screen. If they've held on this long, Lord God, I believe that you have something that you've been trying to talk to them about. That in this moment right now of our time of prayer, Lord, I pray that you would Move close to them and let them experience your holiness. Let them know the desires you have for them. Yes, Lord God, convince them of their desires that they've been trying to fulfill that are leading them down paths that are separating themselves from you. Help them see it clearly. Not that you would hold it over top of them, but that you would open their eyes so that they would desire in their hearts to turn towards you as a loving father and embrace you wholeheartedly. Even yet they have not seen you, yet they believe. Lord God, I pray that in their belief then, you would set them free from the bondage that they have to those things in their carnal nature. That as they confess even now that where they have put their hope and their faith in rather than you, in these things of the flesh, that you would release the bondage that they have to them. That, that they would sense a light load, a lightening of the load upon their back, that they would experience your peace. And that it would become a confident peace, and a constant joy, to know your holiness is being poured upon them in beauty and in love. I pray this in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining me again this week. We'll see you next week as we open up our new series on prayer during the Lenten season. God bless you.